Okay, um, hide that. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to get back to the end of yes, last time was uh, we were talking about polytomous models. So what we talked about uh, models for polytomous data itself. And these are the slides that we sort of got into. Um, this is lecture six. The ideas that we're talking about in IRT are, we, I sort of introduced them with the binary data first because you see a lot of stuff written about binary data in IRT. That was sort of where it came from. But at some point, that doesn't really work for all of us for all of our data. And the reality of it is any data works. You can do this with any type of data. You can do SEM with it. You can do IRT, whatever you want to do. Do it for measurement purposes. You can do it for, you know, you want to put a measurement model in and then use a structural model to predict what's happening in the latent variable. We can do all that simultaneously. And it doesn't matter what the outcome is because ultimately if you have a statistical distribution for data, you can use it however you like. The practical reality of it is, though, that we're sort of constrained by what software we know or we have available to us. So if we were to do this class in M+, which would cost each of you a lot of money or a lot of time waiting for the one computer on this floor that has it, right? Um, we, would, uh, we would be able to use all sorts of distributions because M+, has a lot more available to us. Um, and they do it in the framework where if you can put it in M plus and you can create a latent variable out of it, then you can do you can use the latent variable as a, as a predictor of another variable or being predicted by another variable. So it's the thing that we're trying to set up for structural equation modeling. We're not able to do that in Levon. So once again, we are going to be stuck with data that is categorical, but we're going to use um, we're going to use ordered categories for our data. So this is um, Likert type data. So I think that fits a lot of what you have. Does anybody have data that's not ordered categories by any chance or continuous? Saw the continuous part with the slider bars. I saw that one. Anybody? Sometimes you have a mix of both. Yeah, you can have both. That's fine. Like you have like 40 items, 30 are dichotomous and 10 are polytomous. You can do that. That's completely legitimate. And that's the other thing I forget, keep forgetting to mention. For the outcomes, for the items that you've observed, you can have one item be you know continuous, one item be polytomous, one item be count, whatever. There's no nothing that stops that from being different. And the reason for that is if you think of the set of equations that we just did, like um, our um, version of uh, of like CFA or IRT is like a, a a series of linear regressions where there's multiple regressions happening. Each one of those can be whatever distribution you want it to be. So you've got logistic for one, you've got regular, you know, continuous for another. You can have Poisson or some of these things you may have never heard of, like a negative binomial or a, you know zero inflated things that don't quite fit. When you get to count distributions, life gets really difficult. But none of you have count data, though, right? I have some like tobacco cessation data. Okay, so you may have some of that. Uh, well, I'm not going to do it in the long. Okay, so you, one of the things to know is if, if the if the count is far enough away from zero, on average, the normal is a good approximation for it. the The bigger deal with the count data is like the distributions all make certain assumptions. Again, it's the same thing we're seeing with the binomial or the like the 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 Bernoulli the the one the two categories. The normal distribution has a mean and a, a variance, and they're both separate. In the binomial or Bernoulli distribution, the mean is the probability and the variance is the probability times what times one minus the probability. So they're not separate. And in the count data distributions like Poisson, the mean and the variance are equal. The mean is the variance. Mm -hmm. And so if your data isn't such that the mean is the variance, you're in a condition where if the mean is, uh, if the variance is bigger than the mean, it's something called over dispersion. <laughs> if the variance is smaller than the mean, it's something called under dispersion, and either way, you have to figure out how to best model the data. So another Poisson distribution can be used to model binomial mm -hmm. and distribution for the large enough yes. number of trials. Yes, exactly. But you're saying the normal distribution can be used to model count data with, the num with enough trials. That's, and the reason for that is if you get enough trials, um, the shape of the distribution starts to look normal as you go out in the distance. In mm -hmm. fact, if I were to try to do 
no, 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 trials. I guess say the mean needs to be big enough. So let me just try to try to. It, this is me talking too much, but that's fine. I'll do. It. I'll talk too much. Um, if I take R and I draw a Poisson variable, and let's say I have you know a big number like ten thousand. I want to get a shape of a distribution, and I draw. Um, the mean is, let's say, one. Then if I do hist of temp, take a look. So this is a, a Poisson distribution with a mean of one. You can see it's positively skewed, mm -hmm. and it's right there and there at zero. But if my mean was, instead of one, if it were 100, now take a look at that. Right? So all of a sudden, the count distribution starts to look more symmetric as you get further along. And that's what can happen. The question is how far off of zero are you? Where I use this, um, where I struggle with this in my own data, I like to predict sports outcomes. I've seen that on my website. Um, and, uh, and if you think about the score of each game, it's a count, right? It's like a count of how many points the team scored, depending on you know the game, if it's, uh, American football, then it's you could come up with the score and you know the number of field goals, the number of ways of scoring certain points, or in basketball you could do the same thing. Um, but you know for those for basketball games, the, the average score is fifty or sixty. You know, like you, like, I mean, you know, college basketball. I mean, it's it's way it's in a spot where you look at the shape of the distribution and it's likely to be fairly symmetric. And for a fairly symmetric distribution. Maybe the means a little, you know, if you estimate a mean and the variance, it might be doing the same thing, but it's, it works just about the same. It's when you start getting into soccer, where the score is often 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, something along those lines. Eh, it's a little harder to do accurate versions of that. I realized I didn't send a note out saying we were having class here today, and I'm sorry about that. I should have said, hey, class here Thursday, being clear. Um, so if any of you were confused, my apologies. Uh, we're having a we're having a party. I, I, we heard it was your birthday, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we brought you presents. Did you mail your birthday? No, no, I don't think so. No. I had a one one in three hundred sixty five day chance. Maybe. Somebody half birthday. Half birthday? Yeah, birthday? Anybody? I actually just had one and Peter refused to celebrate my half birthday. Oh my goodness! When was your half October, birthday? October seventeenth. Oh my she goodness! Saw me and literally didn't Does anyone have a no November birthday in here? Yeah. Well, yeah. When? November 12th. 12th? And Bishi? A real birthday. <laughs> a Bishi? What about you? 11th and 12th. Oh, wow. So we'll ha we will ha have whatever that is. There you go. Mine's the 17th. So oh, wow. so you all don't have class on my birthday, but that's a Friday. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. I know, but I'll still have office hours just in case. <laughs> my gift to you. Well, you know. When you get to be my age, you've had enough of them. It's like not that novel, right? <laughs> it's it's it's, it's sort of like how like how I made it another year, right? It's, anyway, um, so does that help you with the count? If you have count data, if if you got a lot of heavy smokers, you're good. <laughs> if you got, yeah, you got a lot of people who are like mm, probably going to have to figure out something different for it. But. I have a question. Yes. I'm struggling with the concept of IRT. So when I use it with like achievement tests to see mm -hmm. students um, like scores mm -hmm. and tests. So the theta is the ability, right? Right. Yes. When I use IRT with, for example, questionnaires or surveys where I'm looking at attitudes or perception, what do we call theta? Factor or trait. It's not the ability. Okay. Right. It's and so ability is a very loaded version of a trait. Okay. And it sort of shows you where IRT was built off of. Yeah. It, right. It was built based on ability. Yeah. It, it was really used, really used in like achievement or aptitude tests yeah. more than anything else. Uh, but ultimately, and that's sort of where item factor analysis has its own lingo, because uh, I think that's probably why it still holds on to some of that. But it's the same stuff. So yeah, think of. Ability is just a very specific name for trait. That's how I do. Um, you know, if 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 personality theorists had created IRT, what would it be called? Well, yeah, okay. we call that openness to experience, or uh, you call that I don't know what it was. A personality theorist say I don't know. So, extroversion. Mm -hmm. Your extroversion goes up. No, I don't know about that. Um, so, 
where we're going to talk about today, I'm going to kind of pick up where we left off last time about the polytomous models, um, because they're they're crazy, but at the same time, the one I'm going to show you is tries to keep it relatively sane. And then um, we're going to then show the example, um, the example data, and then we'll talk about homework four, as Katie asked, and you probably all want to ask. Um, this was the part where I, so I, on my, on my setup at home, thank you all for your patience again, I had the laptop on the side and I had it open so the, so the microphone would pick me up, my voice up enough. And I had two, I have two screens on my, my desktop. So I had one that was showing what you were seeing and I had one with your questions over here. And the question count, it said how many participants were happening. And as soon as I got to this part, I could see the numbers start to go down a little bit. <laughs> and I totally get it, right? Because it's like, oh God, here we go again. More more complication, right? It's complicated, but let's see if we can try to make it simple. As simple as I can. For any type of ordered category data, right? So let's go with Likert data, but let's even go with the correct incorrect data, right? The number of, mo the model that you're looking at is, can be thought of as this, this kind of graded, this ordered category approach the cumulative logit. And so if I can get to the graph a little bit here, going up here like this, okay? So this is an example of an ordered category where we have four categories. So that gives us three lines, three curves here. And these curves all reflect, reflect what we call cumulative probability, right? So if we ordered our categories, we had zero, one, two, and three. These were our or four categories of our data, let's say. Now, you don't have to start at zero. It could be any four numbers, just the low, you know, it could be A, B, C, D if you want, but just A, you know. Then what you're going to end up doing is talking about these lines are going to sort of take different parts of them and talk about the probability of that happening, right? So this first curve talks about the probability of your response being greater than zero. So that's sort of the probability of being a one, two, or a three, right? And so you would interpret that line just like you would any other IRT type curve, right? Instead of saying probability of one or probably, you know, actually, if you think about it, if you have a two category item, that item characteristic curve is still the probability of Y being greater than zero, right? It's what you all saw before. Just now it stops at one. So if you can remember that, that's good. explain it like for a person with an ability of blank yes on um, this item blank 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 okay so for a person of ability of negative two or a theta of negative two trait of negative two uh they have a 50 percent chance of having a score greater than zero they have a right about a little bit about like a 12 percent chance of having a score greater than one and they have a 2% chance of having a score that's greater than 2. All right. So if you think about what that's doing, for this person, if we were to come up with like a contingency table, and in here we have a 0, 1, a 2, or a 3, what this table is trying to tell us, what we're trying to do is come up with the probability that a person is in each of the, has a given value, right? So let's imagine we have a set of probabilities of uh, point. Actually, to do this, we need to go to this curve, right? So this is the probability. This, this, is, this is the cumulative graph, right? Where there's the number of categories minus one curves. These don't directly give you the probability of being in each category, right? They give you the probability of being one or greater, right? So let me see if I can we can reason our way out of this real quick. I need to put up, I guess I went into OneNote before. That's right. So let's add a page. Uh, this is 11, two, okay. Um, so in this regard, um, again, we have the, if we take a look at what we're doing with our data, 
we could give it a zero, a one, a two, or a three. And again, with that graph that we saw before, I said for a theta of negative two, that reflects a 50% chance of being a one or greater, right? So we know there's, this person has a 50% chance there are one, two, or three. So working backwards, what is the chance that there are zero? 0.5, right? So it's a 50% chance. So if this is cumulative over here, <clears throat> This is just uh, straight, <laughs> straight probability, right? Mm -hmm. So this is zero, one, two, or three, right? Mm -hmm. So these are the probabilities for each. So now if we go back to that graph, I said this person has a 12% chance of, of being a um, greater than a one. So that means a 12% chance of being a two or a three. So the question I have is now can you can you work backwards and figure out what the probability of a one is? Right? Well it how would you find it, right? You would have to take the point the what's left, fifty percent, and subtract off the twelve percent from that, right? Giving us point three three. Right? Cool. And then finally I listened and I just it was like, you could just say it was like 130 I probably would have written it down I'm sorry you know it's a funny thing like I used to be really good at arithmetic and I took calculus and I, I can't I can't do it anymore and that was that was years ago it was like 20 years ago I took calculus right I was like seriously like there was a hidden, like, no. Oh gosh! Yeah. Oh, the, sorry. You can't see that. It's uh, what do the what does the what do the faculty say when we teach this that it's so infuriating? Oh, that's just simply third point three three, right? Or use that. It's obvious, yeah. right? It's clearly. Oh my goodness. Those words just drive me nuts. If by the way, if you're ever in the two of you who are REM students, and those of you who might, uh, those of you who are REM's master students, or those of you who are uh, REM's PhD students, also. Or considering this, or write technical stuff. Never, it's never simple until you've figured it out, all right? Once you see the path, you can't unsee it. But that's the right. probability of trinomials clearly Oh my goodness! <laughs> exactly. It's exactly. Uh, sorry, I, I do remember that was my rude introduction to grad school. Rod McDonald. Well, this is obviously this, and off. I, I don't need to do that. That's not cool. When I say that, I, I try to backtrack real quick. But you see where this is going, right, though? Mm -hmm. This is what this is trying to do. It's effectively trying to fill out the probability distribution for a given person. Conditional on their theta, what's their probability of answering in each way? But the way that we activate that is through these cumulative probabilities over here. So, so we, should we work the last one in? The last one I had, uh, like I said, 0.2 chance, is that right, of a, of a, of a, of a 2 or greater? So in this case, it was like a 2% uh, chance down here, right? 2.2 probability. So you, can you figure out what this would be again? All right, it'd be 12 minus 2. There'd be 0.10% chance here, and then this number 3 would be 0 0.02, right? So did you see how this is working? I'm thinking about this like, I mean, it might be a bad metaphor, but yeah. like horse racing. Yeah. So, I mean, the chances of winning are about 0.02, chances of being in the top two is about 0.1. Ex yeah. If you're going to make the medal, you're about a 0.3, and about half the horses are going to lose. That's what we're looking at. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a, go ahead. So, technically, <coughs> yeah, we are now talking <coughs> about the technicality of the analysis of this item. But from the practical perspective, when we report, are we going just to stick with the one with the highest or the two with the highest probability to be no you want to when you if you were to report this information you want to give every parameter for the item so a person could reconstruct the curves themselves oh. right so that means so every one of these so as you know because the slopes are the same so these are essentially parallel curves just placed differently that means there's one discrimination parameter one a parameter for the item which we're going to call a factor loading right there we go right it's the, still the same thing that you learned in, and loved about CFA. It's a factor loading. But now there are um, effectively these, these it's a J, they're tau. Tau ca for category one, this is I category one, and then tau I two, and then tau I three, right? And I will tell you that 
the notation for this varies widely from text to text and from paper to paper and from instructor to instructor and one person's tau is another person be but just the easiest thing to do is take the language that comes out of the software you're using and report it in that fashion because then it's easily replicable right replicable you want to basically be transparent to the people you're trying to do and, and allow them to yes, replicate what you found yes Shada. so the negative two zero two there mm -hmm. for the um so that is can you describe what that is? Yeah, and actually, this these these are. If we were to to convert our thresholds into item difficulty, and remember, in IRT we could do that. They're sort of synonymous. The item difficulty, each each one of our submodels, each one of our cumulative logits here, has an item difficulty, and that again represents the fifty fifty chance of a person with that trait level theta of being at or above that, right? 50-50 chance of being, so let's let's interpret this again. A person with a negative two has a 50% chance of having a probability, of, of having Y being one or one, two, or three. A 50%, someone with a theta of zero would have a 50% chance of having a probability of one or two. And then a probability, uh, the number two would be a 50% chance of having a, 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 a three, essentially, in the item. So that's effectively telling you Kind of how how much probability each person has of being in each class. So let's let's do a little bit of a comparison here, real quick. Um, let me see if I can uh, what the best thing to do would be. Should I play around in R? Would that help? If I played with some numbers, maybe. No, basically playing in R is like that's just like saying obviously, obviously this is working. But um, more examples from my book. <laughs> I was going to say, you, yes, Jesse's in a, taking a, what, what is the class called again? Probability. Probability in the math department, yeah. And so. There's lots of simply and copies. So we're going to. end up being like two pages of proofs because I have to say, wait, I don't get it. Okay. Simply and obvious and clearly and QED, oh, yeah. Yeah, eventually. So what we're going to do is we're going to have three, um, we're just to keep it in item difficulty, although we can translate it to threshold, but let's just keep, keep this straight. Item difficulty would be, if I had a B, I'm going to call this B, uh, B I1, all right? Uh, B I2 and B I3. Now, I know it's capital B, but I want to have the I lowercase. This is like for each of these. We can pick these. And we were picking before um, negative 2, 0, and two, <clears throat> and let's pick a theta real quick here, and we'll take a theta value of let's say zero, right? And so what I want to do is I want to reconstruct what I was just drawing in one note. I want to take, I want to make the cumulative probability table, and I want to make the, the the straight probability table out of it because what this is doing is, again, I. The straight probability table is all where I want to get to. That's the most understandable. If your theta is this, here's your probability of answering this category, this category, this category. And what I want to show you with this is that when we move the values of these Bs around, it effectively talks about the chance of somebody being in each of these categories, right? So if you have a B that's a really far on one extreme or another, it means there's probably not there's probably going to be a lot of people in that category in the middle, but not on the extremes. And that's where I want to work with this. Is this sound like an okay, you see where I'm going rationale wise? Maybe? I don't know. Shada, what do you think? Still digesting. Digesting, yeah. okay. Because probability is the term that you would already heard, like it's like introduction to statistics. Right, right, yes. But then like, but then the context is so complicated that like. Okay, what does it mean, right? Well, yeah. think of it this way. If you uh, if you take someone who is the average person, and so take the average person on your scale, and on the scale example we had was this activities of daily living, the average um, octogenarian, let's say, right? What are What's the chance that they would be able, you know, what's their rating on an item for, like, are you able to um, do housekeeping, right? So what's the probability the average person would do the lowest category or one of the other? Ca That's what this is trying. This is what this model is trying to decipher. So when you say fix on a theta value, 
That's what it means. And so if you start to, to me, um, does that help a little bit? The pro so the problem, so if you think of all the people who are at the average, this proportion of people, they should be re having this, this would be, if you only took the people at the average, this should be kind of their, their histogram. You could write a histogram of what there would be for probability. And then are we still expecting a normal distribution? That's what we're assuming about the okay. trait. It, it, it may not exactly be normal, but let's just assume that to not make that moving as much. So, do you think we could go back to the lecture slides? That yeah. You can, I don't know if you're but there we go. So <laughs> no, you don't. That's okay. <laughs> Blue is the, is, um, has the highest difficulty. The highest difficulty. Mm -hmm. So for this data of this person needing like significant support, two would be the most support. That's right. Yeah. So okay. so or three, I guess in this case, right? Okay. So and then negative two would be the least. Support. That's right. Yeah. So in this this case, a person who is high on the, I guess the daily living is how much help you need, or something along those lines, or maybe it's the other way around. Uh, let me look at the, let me look at the example real quick. Get our context real quick. Uh, zero is cannot do it. One is has no problems with it. Right. Okay, so this is this is right here. If you have a a daily living ability or daily living trait that's a two, you'd have a fifty percent chance of having no problem doing this activity. Uh, right. And so, but if your if your daily living if your daily living uh, um, ability or trait level was negative two, your chance of having no problem goes down to point two or two percent chance. It's like so, so you're probably gonna need a lot of stuff. That's exactly yeah. it. So does that does that start to make sense? Yeah. Okay. So so that hopefully thank you for working with me to try to get the description. I'm yes, I'm working dealing with probability and I'm thinking in a probabilistic sense. But yes, to what this means effectively is that um, you would like to see uh, these items separate themselves so that, you know, again, this the difficulty would be a high difficulty means it's a it's a hard someone with a high level of that trait would have a high chance of getting in that high category. But let's go back. I do want to show this a little bit in R because I want to play around with these numbers. Um, C prob one, C prob two, and C prob three. So these are the cumulative probabilities right here. Let me zoom in here. And this is always the dangerous thing because always, I, I, I kid you not, I always put the, the sign in correct, in, like the value of these incorrectly. So let's see if I can do this right here. Um, in this example, the A parameter was a one. So if I say A equals one here, then to do this, we're doing with logits E of A times the quantity b i1 minus theta and that's over one plus that same thing on the top right here okay. well this is stuff that you don't need to remember right this is there are tools that can help you with this i should know this if i'm teaching your lecture and even I screwed this up. So I just so what like keep in mind this is not exactly perfect. Uh, I'm gonna guess that this is gonna turn out wrong. Every time I've taught this, I've got the direction wrong. Because some people put it in one way and some people put it in another. But if I did it this way, our cumulative probabilities would be um, for a theta of zero. Here, let's do a theta of two here. There we go. Okay. So I, I calculated the probability for theta for negative two. This is this is where we were before. There's a 0.5 chance of being in the first category, and I think I did. Bless you. This is where I've done it wrong. Okay, what did I do wrong? So this is it. They're telling me the cumulative probability. I've got the sign flipped over here, and that's the problem I have. So the probability, this should be 0.12. This is where I'm telling you I do it wrong every, 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 every time, right? Every single time. I should know better by now. But if if I just do, I think if I do this, this will change it around. Don't worry about, I'm trying to, 
again, the program will have the right stuff. There we go. So that sort of changed it around. It should be the right way now. And if I do prob one, it would be the probability. So cumulative probability one. What does that reflect? That's the probability of that y equals one, two, or three, right? Cumulative probability two is the probability that y equals two or three. And cumulative probability uh, three is probability y equals three, right? So if I wanted to do probability one, that's going to be, if I just put the comma in here, probability, probability of getting a one would be the probability of being a zero, or I guess the cumulative probability, yeah, cumulative probability of y equals zero, one, two, or three, minus the cumulative probability that y equals one, two, or three, right? So we know the probability that someone is zero, one, two, or three has to be a one because they can't respond in any other way. And again, ignore missing data for right now because the same thing holds. Just don't want to. Let's let's just pretend there's no missing data. Doesn't that give you the probability of being a zero? Yes, that's right. So prop. Sorry, right. this is right. Prop zero. Yes. Thank you, Katie. It's not easy. I, I haven't taken calculus in the recent past, so. It's not about calculus. Are so sharp. This is not easy. So your addition skills are sharp. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. that was the That's good. <laughs> this is this is good. Uh, prob one equals uh, then probability one would be like as we just talked about the probability of one, two, or three, right? Minus the probability of two or three, right? So that would be C prob one minus C prob two. Prob two equals C, same thing, the probability of two or three minus the probability of three, or C prob two minus C prob three. I promise this is gonna be worth it, or at least I think it, I promise I think it's gonna be worth it. <laughs> and C prob three is, is actually C prob three, probability of three is the probability of three minus the probability of three or greater, which can't happen until it's zero, right? So these are our, our numbers. Those are our probabilities. And if I were to plot this, let's do hist of C of prob zero, prob one, prob two, and prob three. Uh, now I want level, how many categories, how do I, breaks, is that the right, the There. That's not cool. No. <laughs> no, I want uh how about I just do plot then? I know what's a good graphical tool for this? You know what? Uh plot? Would that work? This probably won't do it either. There we go. Yeah, there's a probability. So that'll count. Does that count? Can you sort of see where those probabilities are? I'm sorry. I wish I would have bar charts. Anyone know how to make a quick bar chart of that? Bar graph? Bar plot. Hang on. Height equals, see if I can do this. Let's see, there are times I hate R as well. There! Okay, and then let's make the X axis uh, or the Y axis. Is it Y limb equals C of zero, one? There we go. So these are our probabilities, and those are all the four categories. I won't, you want me to put labels on them? Okay. So let's, let's play with the numbers. You question, Mayumi. Sorry, you're eating. I'm going to take a drink, though. Anybody else want to eat? No, I want to um, understand the theoretical be um, behind the mm -hmm. one you're doing. Mm -hmm. So nine, fifteen, twenty-five, thirty-five, forty-five, sixty-five, seventy-five, eighty-five, ninety-five, hundred, 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 <laughs> there we go. Nine. This one. Yes. This one right here. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. oh my gosh. I'm so retarded. I'm sorry. I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. Back up. Back up. Back up. Yeah. Stupidity on my part. I didn't even put Vedum on his B. Sorry, everybody. I am, I'm having brain issues today, and I'm not... All there. Oh my goodness. I am embarrassed. 
You see, I'm like flushing. I'm like bright red, right? My ears are on fire. <laughs> I'm, we can <laughs> So whenever you think it's hard or it's really hard, just realize it's hard for all of us. And it would be better if I put the theta minus b. But Mayumi, yes, you are right. Okay. Slide nine. Line eleven. Oh yes, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll make, I'll make mistakes here too. You really got to audit me because I'm I'm drawing into question all the stuff that I felt like you you guys really trusted me on before, aren't I? <laughs> all right, let's see if I can get this straight though. Okay, so you were asking about the formula, and this is exactly where it's coming from. So, so slide nine. These are the equations. And had I gotten the right, it's A times theta minus B. This is basic IRT I should be remembering here. And I'm, it's because, you know what the thing is? I'm so used to screwing this up. I'm just expecting it to happen. And I'm like, anyway, my apologies. I am so sorry. Um, these are the equations where that's coming from. Okay. And so the probability of why, why that we're going to predict what's happening in this feature is effectively because the, we're, we're taking these cumulative terms and we're sort of subtracting the ones that are nested within each other, right? So everybody's a 0, 1, 2, or 3, so that means 100% there. But P1 represents the people who are 1, 2, or 3. So figuring out those probabilities from it gives you that difference. Does that help? Mm -hmm. So this is with a theta of negative two. So this, if, this is where, if, if the items were the curves that we just saw, right, jeez. Uh, back over here. No, no, this one right here, slide 10. This would be the probabilities that came. From. These would be the probabilities that came from with this graph right here. Let's play around with some of the numbers. What happens if the discrimination goes up? What do you think happens to those probabilities? Well, let's, let's rerun this. So now all of a sudden, hmm. the person with a negative two has a really high chance of being in either category zero or category one, but very low in the other two. Why is that the case? Let's flip over to our graph and show that. All right, so here's our negative two. It's a 50-50 probability that they're a zero or one, two, or three, right? So zero versus one, two, or three. We know from that because we know zero is on the, the, the other half of that, 50% chance of zero. What's the probability that they're a two or three? It's so small that when we do that subtraction for the next category, that's where the drop-off happens, right? That's why this remaining 50%, we subtract the 2% off of it, or however much it is, it happens to be, um, the cumulative probability is 0.17 for it. We drop that down. So what, what's happening is, when we have high discrimination, we get to see a very high distinguishing between the categories that a person might be in. Ahmed. Basically, my line doesn't say 16 and 17 and R. Line 16 and 17. Yes, that's exactly right. So 16, if we're talking about the probability of being zero, we know that that's we know that's 50% because we're right at that difficulty. The probability of one is the remaining 50% minus the 0.17 that we have right here, uh, 0.17 for that next probability. So that gives us 48%. And then the, then finally after that, you take a look at the dot that's even below that. If they want to talk about the probability of this person being a three. Or it's even smaller, right? And it's even more subtraction. Yes, Katie. I'm sorry, Shada. So, when I'm all off is today. Higher, uh -huh. Like slide 11. Mm -hmm. um, there's a greater probability that a low difficulty item mm -hmm. will be answered correctly by a person with lower dif with lower ability. That's right. Okay. So the higher the discrimination, the more the uh, the ability relates to the number that you're picking on the item itself, right? So if I did like a 20, what do you think is going to happen? 
it's going to be even more pronounced 50 50 but because this person's right at the middle of the difficulty we can't tell if they're a zero going to pick a zero or one but we definitely know they're not going to pick a, a two or a three right what if i did a very low difficulty what if i did like a point one right all of a sudden now we know that there's a really high chance mm -hmm. that what's going to happen is these lines will be very flat. Mm -hmm. And because they're very flat, and the difference between any two of them will be very small, the biggest difference will be the people who are at the end themselves. And I think I have a picture of that in this right here. Right? This is sort of the probabilities that go with that. So, so that's sort of manipulating the diff, the discrimination. The bigger the discrimination, the more the the trait value aligns with the category it should be with, right? So that if, if the discrimination is high and positive, like 20, what you should find is the higher the trait, the more likely the value is going to be at a uh, and the high category, right? So here's a probability of a three, right? Or better yet, we had a, here, here, a theta, we did theta of negative two before. What happens if our theta was just a little bit off of negative two? What if we did negative two point five? Now look at that probability, right? The probability is huge, and that's because that curve for that um, our curve for this low category here is effectively like this like this right here and when it's like that step function it just takes a little bit of difference on theta and you're down in the you know in this case the probability of being a one or greater would be very small right so let's see how that's happening so what else can i talk about let's so that's discrimination the other part i want to tell you if you have it what do you think happens if if our discrimination is negative then the, the higher the theta, the lower the category, or the lower the theta, the higher the category. Right? So this just switches what's happening. Right? So it's the same thing you saw in factor analysis. It's only now we've taken what we're predicting about what theta should be and then chunking it into these categories, right? Is this helping? Okay. I hope this is helping. I'm not guaranteed of anything today. <laughs> I don't know what the problem is. I promise I haven't been drinking this morning. I can tell you that much. <laughs> this is not my uh, not something I purposely did. Um, but I will tell you this. Uh, let's play around with the theta, the categories again. Let's play around with the, di the difficulty values. What if we change those to different values? What if we moved one of the difficulties? Oh, uh, let's take this low. Let's take this. Uh, let's go back to where we started. Theta of negative two. Our difficulties were negative two, zero, and two, and our discrimination was one. So that's that first graph we were drawing on today. So this is this is what the probabilities look like. What happens if we move, let's say, the second difficulty, and we put it real close to the very first one, like that? What do you think is going to happen? Oops. Yeah, the middle one goes away completely. Ooh. Right? So what's happening is whenever you see a pair of these categories that are real close to each other, it's telling you that very few people pick that response. And why is that? Let's let's draw the graph again. Back over here. That would be like having this, this second line right on top of this first one right here. And so you talk about the probability of being a one or, or two or one, two, or three is right here. The probability probability of being a two or three is just a little bit smaller than that. So when you take the difference in those two probabilities, that number goes down to zero. Right? And so it's saying that. So in the graph, will like the pink and the yellow, if you did that, be like really close to each other? That's exactly it, yeah. Okay, so when those are really close to each other, or the difficulty is almost the same, mm -hmm. then you can almost say that like which response is... Not there. Not so. No, no, yeah, exactly. You want to so you want to say okay. So in this case, it would be the one that's uh, it would be the one that's sort of associated with what the number here happens to be, right? So this is a uh, so it's a second response. So it's like what what is the val what's the what what is the sorry what is the num numeric order of the difficulty that's right on top of the first one? Yeah. That's the response that's going to be lacking. Okay. So whichever one is kind of in the middle. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So if number two is real close to number one, 
the number two, the, the second response is lacking. Um, if the other side, if, if I switch this around, if number two is real close to number three, then what we should see is, is, is category three should be lacking. Right? And, and, and likewise, category four, effectively, depending on how far away this is from the extreme. So then the other thought is what happens when we have a real extreme value like negative 20, which occasionally, occasionally happens. <laughs> so if the very first value gets really low, you've effectively shut off the probability of the lowest category because if that 50-50 point would be down below where nobody has a theta, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, but I don't... Yeah, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't find that. Most likely what happens in the assessment is like the graph that was here, which is sort of the low category and the high category tend to get circled. It's the ones in the middle that start to disappear. Mm -hmm. So on that last one, like the negative 20 being mm -hmm. for B1, mm -hmm. then you're basically saying that you're creating an item that is... Um, so easy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So basically, it's really easy to get below above the lowest category. Yes. Right. What about this one? What if I did negative twenty and negative nineteen? Then the one, one and two should be gone, right? Right. <laughs> All right. So this is the item that says, you know, effectively, I think killing people is wrong, or you know, like <laughs> agree or strongly agree, right? Or something. I guess I know that's not true because. There's a very small probability here, but you know we'd need to make that some value that we'd have to make it at work. But and when you say lacking, lacking like, in like the capacity, it's just there's nobody who answered in that okay. cell, okay. right? So the so when you think when what the model is trying to do is reproduce the data, mm -hmm. and if you did a frequency table of your data, gotcha. and you saw there was 0 .1, 0 0.01 probability of being in one of these cells, the model is going to give you that. So you go back and look at these numbers, you start looking at the data, you're like, okay, that's reproducing something that's going on in my data set. What is it? Oh, there's someone lacking. Mm -hmm. So. But when you make the scale, strong agree and then agree, maybe have similar difficulty, and agree and disagree have It could be, could be, yeah. It could be, it depends on, it depends on the wording, it depends on so many things. It depends on the question, the context, the wording. And the and actually how clear the anchors are as well. Um, so I don't know that there's a real clear answer to what it would be, but I will tell you this: um, in the gambling example, which you'll do homework four on, we have we did the same thing. We have this. There's only like uh, 26 items because homework four is mapped on from M plus, and and Levon didn't do everything Levon, M plus did, so I just dropped them for you. So there's not a lot of items, but there's like four or five models you have to run. Um, there, um, in that homework, uh, you'll see in the six category items, we had like binary items and, you know, yes and no, there's a small proportion of people who are endorsing gambling type items. There's not a lot of gamblers in our data set, which is typical. But then when you look at the items, actually, these are pretty, these are actually pretty, um, pretty experienced gamblers. But if you look at the overall data set of everybody from the general population, not a lot of gamblers. So that's with zero one items. But if you go and say, basically, you know, I think about gambling a lot, you know, yes or no versus here's a six point Likert scale. Strongly agree, you know, strongly disagree. Turns out, you know, if you say no, it probably maps on to strongly disagree for that item. All right. So what you're going to end up seeing is that uh, the use of category scales. Now, these data are a little bit different in homework. I should I should back up because I'm getting interference from the study that had like 1300 responses that were all over the place where we only had a hundred real hundred or so real gamblers like from a casino boat and the rest were college students um that study you know the bulk of the the the, the people who were college students had never gambled in the, or at least never gambled seriously in their life um so you would look at their distribution and it'd be small numbers of people in each of those categories and so what you'll see is this, this wonky the values of these numbers that you get so the other thing that you'll see is um Oftentimes, if you don't have somebody in a category, if you go and collect Likert data and you look at your data, if you try to run this one of these models for Polytimus data, 
um, it might break. And the way why it might break is it can't figure out where to put that that difficulty or that threshold, right? Because if there's nobody there, it's like that category doesn't exist. So effectively, instead of having four categories, you should only have three. And actually, if you do, if you actually literally have zero people in a category, like if you had these data were zero, one, two, three, and nobody for one of these items had one, then the way that Levon and M plus will code this is it won't, it will go look at your data and it will just go in order alphanumerically, right? And so whatever zero was will become the lowest category. Whatever two was, because one didn't exist, will become the second lowest category. Whatever three was will become the third lowest category. And it will treat it as if there's three categories, meaning you only have two thresholds, not three. And so in that case, what happens? You look at your output and you're like, wait a minute, there's only two thresholds here. You know what's happening is that there's somebody, one of the categories is getting used. Is that, I feel like I'm worrying you now. Isn't that problematic? Yeah, it can be. It's, it's imprecise. Say there's like a measure for, I don't know, like access to general education or something. And mm -hmm. there's a student who requires, you know, significant support. Absolutely. And so their access is going to be, like, they're never going to say, like, I don't need any support in these areas. Because, that, so that entire category is, like, basically not applicable. To them. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that. Um, this actually brings up a bigger point particularly depending on the, the set of the students. So if you have, like in your your case, um, if you look at the sample of students you might get that survey to, a very, a, a very a specific type of student may need lots of supports, but others may not need certain ones, right? And so it starts to get into what we would call measurement invariance issues, right? So I've got this one group of students that don't reply to any of these categories. And I've got this one group of students that do right so what do you do about that and i think that's that's a significant issue i don't think there's an easy way to sugarcoat that so um there are statistical methods we're going to get into next about measurement and variance that involve this as well which are really important but ultimately it's very difficult to resolve problems when you don't observe somebody in a category because it's like that category just doesn't exist and for that population or for that one specific student and if they're really representative of a group of people who would be like that, then that was just reality. You have to lock that in. So hope that helps a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, I think that just comes up a lot. Yeah. Our, our oh experience. gosh, yes. The population that we're interested in is either like not represent is not representative. Oh yes. How do you represent them? Yeah, and 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 so it's even yeah, in particular also. Um, you know, if I'm thinking research-wise, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, now you're in a really good lab and you have access to a lot of students and so forth, but if you're in a state or in a district, um, you may not have a big enough sample who are exactly like that, right? And so how do you, how do you, um, how do you go and go? Those are questions that don't have easy answers right now. There are some ways around it. Um, that we can get into, we can talk a little bit more about, but it's sort of outside of what we plan to cover here. Uh, one of the methods that we can talk about would be uh, like a Bayesian approach where you're saying, well, yeah, I know in the sample there isn't a lot of people, there aren't data for this, but if I had a prior distribution that would say where this should be, I could sort of give a... Right, or if you've looked at, um, you know, maybe you're, a, a certain district might be like a different district, or like try to try to get some information about what it might be, trying to borrow information. But it's not easy. It's not. Yeah. Um, and that is a frequent problem. And actually, I, I think in special education, it would be a very significant problem. You know, in, in asking about gambling, it's a problem, but it's like, it's not the same, right? It's not. Well, it doesn't have the same sort of like social. Absolutely not. Importance. Right, right. Or, but the thing <laughs> yeah. is, I mean, the thing is, if I'm trying to pin down what a person's tendency to gamble is. Yeah. Right. If there if there's just not a category there, okay. So I change the type of item. Mm -hmm. But if this is a if this is a, a well established type of item, where a group of students are have all of it, but one specific group doesn't, you know, that's a legitimate concern that has to be addressed. And how do you, you know, how do you go about doing that? Yeah. But there are ways to do that. Um, they're not easy though. So hope that helps a little bit. Very good question. Yeah, this brings up a lot. Of, I will tell you the categorically polytomous item models. 
I feel like are more representative of your data. And the reason for that is because when you get these probability distributions that map onto your data, um, when we talk about the, the big complaint about mapping a Likert scale in C to CFA to being continuous, is the difference between a 4 and a 5 may not truly be a difference between a 4 and a 5. But if we had an item that looked like the first one I drew on here, like this, right? the difference between the lowest category and the third category is a huge divide, right? And that's that's a big difference. And so, you know, even when even if we were to do something like this, right? So there, now it's even more pronounced, right? If we had a, a different type of discrimination parameter, right? Um, you know, so the point is, it's not, you know, for whatever reason, there's nobody here, whatever reason that is. Sorry. Are you, <laughs> Polygamist? Is that what they're called? Polytimus, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> like, that's a I'm having a rough day speech-wise, and, and I totally would expect, if I were you, I would expect me to say something like that today, because <laughs> I'm polytimus, P-O-L-Y, here, let me type it, or write, type it, let me type it, because right, oh, gosh, I am failing all over the place, I'm sorry. Polytimus, polytimus, polytimus. And the thing is, it's not like in dictionaries. It's not. See, that's what's hard it's word will not recognize it. I write something it. in Word, and it highlights in red as being wrong, and I get so frustrated. Oh, oh here's the one that kills me. That, that like, the, the, the high, the, the high discriminate, no, the high difficulty item for agreement, if I'm going to put this in the IRT context, take a, take a poll of psychometricians in the field and ask them what one of the options on a multiple choice is. How do you spell it? Is it distractor with an O? Or an E. Or an E. <laughs> Right, because nobody has, and it's like that—that's one of those one of those ones that really separates people. I, so, so I, I completely agree with you. Polytomus, polytomus. Uh, Why don't we just call polytomus? Uh, ordered categories. Ordered categories. Uh, the it's it's it's, it's a poly, as opposed to um, uh, dichotomous. Right. Which That's has two, word. yes, which doesn't sound like polygamous, thankfully. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Today is one of those all-time crash and burn days. No, I totally, I totally, no, I, I'm, I'm looking at this as a reflection of me. I'm stuttering. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I admit it. I'm sorry. Um, but yes, polygamous. So if your categories came out like this consistently in like a very large, big national sample, would you think about just eliminating one of the liker items, like taking it from like a seven to a five or something? Exactly, exactly. Or change the type all altogether. Like that's what, it. What kind of? Uh, well, I mean, yeah. You, so like you said, seven to five, um, a five to a three. You, you know, like something. Change anchors to better fit. Or? Something along those lines. Anchors would be another reason. You know. Um, I'm a big believer and you have to sort of clearly label the anchors for each item. So make sure that they're clear what the choices are and so forth. But it happens. And in fact, it happens almost all the time. That's the thing. It, it's, in my experience, this is the first thing. When you try to run this with your data, it, it probably won't work. So what do you do next? Well, in our class, because we're not getting into Bayesian, one of the options people would do would be to combine categories. To take category two and one, or one and zero here, maybe lump them together. You know, like a zero or one. All right, you can, but if no one's in it, it's, but it's exactly, it's, it starts to lose. Well, because it's not a, like a direct, like reflection. Exactly. So it makes sense if like zero and one were both reflections of a le certain level of disagreement. Could be. And, yeah. Could be, definitely. But it's, but you're starting to do. When you're starting to manipulate data because the data are not working with the model, yeah, it, it starts to it, it, it's a lot a layer of subjectivity and parceling. We can identify as like completely. We can say why that I can show the model that should be. I can't necessarily show the model for this, but that's sort of because when you don't have anybody in the cell, you it's it's equivalent to say that cell is plus this one. Or that cell is plus this, you know, you, it's, it becomes, it, there's no, I think, objective way of deciding, well, I should lump that with this one or lump that with this one, right? Yeah. So it's tough to say. It's not a good, um, not a good system either way. How are we doing, by the way? Is this helpful? These models are insane. Um, <laughs> I just, I don't know how to put it. And the thing is, this is the, this is the, this is the 
first one we talk about, and it's the one that's most predominantly used, and it's really difficult to understand. The ones after this are even worse, right? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, I know you said that we won't need to do this. Mm -hmm. Is this? Are there examples of this in your code? Example? Yes. Let me let me show the code real quick here. No, this is great. I want to show the code. There are examples of it. Uh, you will need to do. You won't need to do the plot, but um, I do make a plot for you. Uh, there's a, a code function. Let me. Can I just go through the code overall? And then, yeah. so the good thing about the code is nothing in the syntax for the polytomous model changes from what you would do for the dichotomous model. They are all the same, and the reason for that is with the only difference in the being the number of thresholds. Like right, you have to specify that you need more than one. You don't right. see. So the baseline syntax for it is actually you don't need thresholds. So like this. This very simple syntax that you see here, like if you if you omit all the thresholds, which you can do for most analyses until we get to measurement and variance, um, that will run it. It will run it. It will run it because you've told it ordered equals in the in the SC, the CFA statement. The ordered equals allows this statement to run for whether you have two categories or ten. It just treats it that way and it puts in the right number of thresholds. So the good news about syntax is comes out to be roughly the same. The model fit, all the stuff that you'd see before is identical. Uh, so you talk about RMSEA, um, CFI, TLI, chi-square, all that stuff. Factor loadings come out as well. But now the difference is for each item you'll find more thresholds, right? So this is this item. Now the threshold is a little bit different. The threshold is a different animal than the, the difficulty. And I sort of describe things in difficulty, but you're gonna get output from threshold. Remember the threshold, if I go back to the slides, and this was slide nine, right here, the threshold, you if you take the negative value of it, it represents the expected logit when, th when theta or the factor is zero, right? So that's sort of what a person at the average of the trait would do, where the 50-50 point for the average would be, right? So, um, so it's a little bit different. But after you do the, that, um, if you get down to the bottom, I have this function called Levon cat item plot. Levon doesn't plot any of these things for you, which was really frustrating when I looked. I really struggled with which direction I was going to take us because I was hoping it did a little bit more, but it doesn't. But it will give you the, I, I like the, this, the actual probability response. This is not the cumulative model. This is the, the probability response itself. The, the value that you get, right? So it will give you a plot. If you tell it basically what variable name and how many standard deviations of the factor you want, it will take the mean of the factor plus or minus that number of standard deviations and come up with the probability. Now, how do we interpret this graph right here? This is the actual probability. This is that contingency table with the four cells of probability for each of the thetas that we might have. So a theta of zero right here this is item two, by the way, it says there's a almost 100% chance a person with an average theta would answer the highest category on this item. And then the others are effectively zero. Can I bring a little bit more context into that item? Would that be, does this help you, Katie, with your answer question? No, uh, no. No, it's okay. This, this graph is just confusing to me, so I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Let me, let me try to describe what that is. Um, item two was what proportion of people, uh, can you, um, can you basically, do you need help or better yet, instrumental activities, daily living, this is for bed making. Can you make your bed and, uh, or make your bed by yourself? And this is either zero, can't do it, one big problems, two some problems, or three no problems, right? So a person has to pick or a caregiver has to give a report for a person of that. And here for item two, these are the thresholds right here, these values. Um, and 
this is the factor loading itself, right? So what we're looking at here is saying, if we take the average, the average uh, ability person, the average person of a, of a given ability of living independently, for bed making, they would have a probability of close to one of having no problems making their bed, right? If we go down a, a, theta, a level to like theta of one, negative one right here, one standard deviation below the average, then we start to see some variability, right? So I'm putting the dots on each of the lines. Okay, the highest probability response comes from category two right here. So they would have a, about a 60% chance or so, 62% chance of saying uh, they're at, uh, have some problems, right? Some problems making their bed. Um, they have a 25% chance of saying they have no problems they have a less than 10% chance of saying lots of problems, and they have very, virtually no chance of saying uh, can't do it, right? So does that help? So, each, so this is like if you take a slice of this graph by one number, the height of the graph, the, the height of the line represents the numbers in that contingency table that we're after. Uh, so it's sort of what the numbers go into to give us this, this bar graph. Having the average ability be zero? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So what's happening with this is we're saying this is a what we call this is a very easy item, right? A lot of people are able to do to make their own bed in this group of, of people that we have. Question? I'll take a drink, but I know Maybe someone spiked my drink today. Maybe that's it. No, no, I probably know that too. I poured the drink. So. For a perfect item, that's like a perfect sample. Mm -hmm. So like it has good distinguishing capacity, a discriminating capacity, and it's like a good difficulty for that sample. Mm -hmm. Then you would want each one of these lines. To be a little bit distinct. Spaced out, maybe the same slope. Yeah, um... Like that pretty one. Right about that, yeah, like this, right here. That's that's sort of what we the the sort of the standard. But then again, it's not going to be that way. And the fact that this item doesn't look like that is actually, I think it's okay. All right, you're not hurting your data. In fact, I think you're helping get a better estimate of theta when you treat the item like this. To me, let me let me do one other thing. Let me see if I can. Again, again, dangerous. Um, I will uh, post the R script later on the website from today if you want to play around with this as well. I'd like to pull up the example. I only have a couple minutes left. I'd like to pull up this example and try a couple of the other items to show what they look like as well. Because I would like to, t I'm, I'd like to make the case that this type of item is, is the most common um, that we see. This is, this is sort of typical. Um, for what we get here. I mean the plot. The plot, yeah, the thalidomide time. This, when we have real data, it's not clean. It's not. It's actually quite messy. So here's where the danger is. How long will it take to run all to make this work? I should have brought this ahead of time. So while we're the oh, did it do it? Okay, let me go. Right, uh oh, does not have. Oh, of course, I don't have GG plot on here. Okay, okay, okay. Um, if I don't have ggplot, it's going to take a while. There it is. Okay, I guess I didn't put it at the top. Nope, I need to, uh, I need to amend the example too. My apologies. Now, this function should run right here. There's our plot. Okay, let's imagine we do... Item one, let's take a look at what it looks like real quick. Bless you. Okay, so that looks, does that look better? Maybe a little bit? There's at least a certain range of theta that has the right number of, or at least where the, each one is, is a peak. So you would infer from that that this is a little bit more difficult? A little bit more difficult of task. They're moved over to the, the that way, the yeah. Right? That's also true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the discrimination for this item, um, for item one, is actually a little bit less discriminating. Three point four five versus three point six two. 
but you'll see the categories are such that they're, or the thresholds are such that they're moved over a little bit more, right? And so we can take a look at item three as well. So you are saying that this item is difficult? Just below average? There are more people who are, um, the, 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 because the lines are moved over this way, <clears throat> that way. More difficult than the previous one. Though. It was more difficult than the previous one. Now this one's oh, an easier oh. item. This is an easier. This is a little bit easier because the lines are moved back over that way. Yeah. Right, and so. That looks more like one. It does, yeah. yeah. And so, and then uh, item four. So I'm just trying to give you a sense for what this, how this works. Oh, this is fun. Is it? <laughs> there we go, item four looks nice. No, Katie rolls her eyes. Yeah, I do. I totally agree. <laughs> totally agree with you. <laughs> no, I did. Sorry, I saw the look. I know that look because I've I've done that every time I get data from this. Like, oh god, here we go again, right? Okay. Here's the here's the tough part. No, it's okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call you out. The hard, the tough part for me with this is, is I think this is a much more legitimate model for data when they're categorical. But it there's a step in difficulty like of, of trying to do it. So there's a part of the part of me says, you know, the CFA world exists and still there. Why are we doing that still? And it's partly because this is you can't easily automate this with most data. You have to be much more uh, inspective of the items, inspective of what's happening, and a lot of times things just break. And the where, why they break is because of lack of people in, in cells. Um, now it's one fifteen. Homework four. I, can I just spend thirty seconds? I know I'm running late, and I hate doing this. Homework four has, I think, 26 or 28 items. Uh, it's not available just yet. Is it not? No. no. Oh, my goodness. No, oh, it should be available. If you go to homework two, you can see homework four. Oh, but it's not listed on the Huh. It's listed on mine. So you can't see this right here where homework four is? The link isn't working, by the way. If you go Oh, the link. Sorry. Yeah. Pardon me. If you go to the, go the homework, homework website, you can. Yeah. Sorry. Well, I can make the due date. Let's just talk about it. It's 26 items. There's about four models you have to build that are virtually the same syntax as CFA. Do you think you could do that by, let's say, next Friday? No, honestly. Would you like a little bit longer? Your definition is virtually the same. <laughs> Um, you know, well, okay. literally the same. Well, right. Okay. Okay. If it's literally the same, we're good. Literally the um, same with respect. You don't have to put all the thresholds in. You can yeah. just put the ordered equals in the CFA c command. That's, will, will we still be able to kind of communicate with you on oh, yes. Thursday for Starlink? Oh, yeah. Stuff? Absolutely. I mean, then I think that's fine. So, Because I could do the following uh, Monday after that. Would you like a weekend? Mm -hmm. we, I'm trying to think of, I'd like to give you time to practice this on your own data, too. Yeah. Uh, and that's like the next assignment. I honestly don't care when it's due, but I'd like to get our homeworks. Yeah, yeah. You no, see what I'm saying? Friday's fine. Yeah. Okay. So we for, say, how about this? Friday, and I'm lenient if you can't make Friday. Okay. Right. Let me know, and you will get an extension. I don't care if it's till the end of the semester. Just <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm no, I'm serious. I'm serious. All right. Thanks, everybody. No, I'm ser I'm trying to be. I just. I'm not trying to do this. I'm trying to do this to teach you how to do it. I'm not trying to. Right. Yeah. So. But I think it's better because no time is going to be better. Right. Yeah. Oh, right.